Alright. Yeah, so what is your question? So like in the sales, you are taking the example of Alibaba shares, like the company selling the shares of Alibaba, people have to make the sales in the case of front office. So I'm asking No, no, I didn't talk about that. That's not sales. That is, uh, you're talking about the primary capital markets function. Front office role, like sales, you have sales. So front office roles we have talked about sales that is under the under what kind of function guys under let's recap this if he's talking about what what are you talking about sales trading and research yeah, yeah. so that falls under what kind of uh, atomic level uh, function sales trading and what what are you saying so I be, I be. but that falls under what kind of uh, what kind of uh, I have listed the prototypical firms which is these are the atomic level functions okay uh, under which of these functions is sales trading and uh, research in the secondary capital markets i said that secondary capital markets the function is under what kind of uh, activity listed here there's a bunch of activities listed here there's a bunch of activities listed here in column c yes sir. which of those activities did i say that secondary cap capital markets is like it's just a subset of those activities what you got the answer on the next column itself in the next column itself you can see the are you following my question no. he's asking a question about sales trading and sir, research market maker. Sir, market, 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 market making operations so what is that secondary capital markets uh, business it's essentially a market making operation so it is based as the, the heart of that operation is the trading desk and they are supported by the trading desk is supported by Trading desk is part of the front office, front office. but the, what did I mention? Uh, the, it's a it's a market making operation, right? Secondary capital markets operation is a market making operation, so it falls under this category of the uh, general market making operations. What does it say here? What does it say here? Let's roll it up a little bit so that people in the corners can see it. What does it say here? Market making in all assets, including. Secondary okay, so that's a subset of all asset classes because in secondary capital markets you have only debt and equity. Okay, so but you have to understand that a secondary capital markets operation located inside an investment bank is actually nothing but a market making operation as an atomic level of uh, function core function within the financial services sector. It's actually a market making operation. So the heart of the market making operation is the trading desk because they are the guys who are making prices. Is this clear? Now the trading desk is supported in this activity by which two types of functions? Research, research, and, research, and, research. research and sales, right? So this is the operation that you have to understand. Mm -hmm. So a typical market making operation. So when you see, you can see this manifested in two types of settings. You can see this in a typical secondary capital markets operation within an investment bank. Okay, so you will see a trading, uh, a trading desk, which is trading in equity and debt securities. Okay, and making markets in equity and debt securities and it is being supported by sales and research which are also focused on those types of assets so you will have this is where your equity research comes in right where you hear about all these equity research people okay you hear many there are many high profile jobs in equity research right so this is where equity research fills fits in it is in the front office of the secondary capital markets operation and it is supporting the trading desk actually so the function of the res of equity research is essentially to inform the institutional investors mainly targeted at institutional investors to give them input to give them sufficient input so that they can form a view on the stock okay so that whether you should buy or sell a particular asset so that's what equity research is doing but if you go to a commercial bank like if you go to a standard chartered bombay uh, office you go to the treasury of the Sta of standard chartered bombay that's a commercial bank that's not really an investment bank okay if you go to a commercial bank treasury there also you will find a market making operation so it is fundamentally the same operation so there you'll see a market making operation mainly focused on foreign exchange and money markets okay foreign exchange money markets and it could also be focused on commodities but that is a little bit less uh, common okay but mainly if you look at foreign exchange which is one of the most important markets in the world so you'll see a foreign exchange if you take the example so the point i'm trying to emphasize here is that when you see a secondary capital markets operation a trading operation or a secondary capital markets operation sales trading and research inside an investment bank focused on equities and debt and then when you go to a commercial bank treasury operation and you see a foreign exchange trading desk that will also be supported you should have the basic abstract concept in your head that this is a market making operation so it will have traders at the heart of the operation and it will have sales and trading uh, sales and research to support it 
so when you go to a commercial bank treasury uh, and then you see the foreign exchange trading desk you will see that they're also supported by foreign exchange sales and foreign exchange research and the job is again the customer base is a little different there would be some overlap in the customer base that they're also talking to institutional investors okay like international investors who are investing across borders they have to deal in foreign exchange okay and then but mainly they'll be talking to corporate customers and also uh, you know asset managers fund managers hedge fund hedge funds alternative asset managers who want to trade in foreign exchange so this again but the point is that you have to, are you following what i'm saying that you should have this abstract concept in your head of a market making operation which is basically at the heart of which is the trading desk and then that trading desk is supported by sales and research so you could now take this abstract concept and apply it to a secondary capital markets operation okay in an investment bank or you could take the same concept and apply it to a foreign exchange trading desk in a commercial bank treasury like you go to a stanchart treasury or a hdfc treasury or a city bank treasury you see the foreign exchange trading desk conceptually is the same you have a trading desk focused on a particular asset class in this case foreign exchange and again they are supported by foreign exchange research and foreign exchange sales so you'll have and as i mentioned to you sometimes because foreign exchange is such a big market and so many players are involved sometimes you can get really specialized you can have people who are doing fx you can have actually large teams handling fx option sales so if you go back to our framework that means they are located in just that one box under foreign exchange they are under currencies we can open that framework also just to see uh, i mentioned this earlier so shouldn't have to redo this because it's all captured on video but anyway the point i'm trying to emphasize is when you get very big markets specialization is a function of size if you have tremendous amount of volume then you can afford to specialize okay because the volume in foreign exchange because foreign exchange itself is such a massive uh, market because and so even foreign exchange options have become quite big so uh, therefore you can actually have a, a sales team that is purely focused on foreign exchange options so they don't sell any spot fx business or they don't sell fx swaps or fx futures any such fx forwards or not. they purely focus on selling fx option products so what will they do there will be an fx option trading desk within the larger foreign exchange trading operation there will be again if you see if you have trading in currencies if you have a foreign exchange trading desk okay this is currencies you can trade in so many different instruments are you following you can any asset class you can trade in so many different instruments so within a larger foreign exchange trading operation you can have a spot trading desk a forward trading desk are you following now because these are all different instruments what happened why is everybody looking like a zombie yes am i making sense or not yes yes sir because what did we mention that any time you see prices for any of the asset classes any market it is always the price of some instrument yeah. either some instrument either you're looking at spot prices or forward you don't have just abstract prices it has to be price of some instrument right so there are all separate markets within each of these there are sort of separate for a supermarket kind of structures that you have a separate supermarket for fx foreign exchange options okay and you know so that kind of structure so therefore you can actually you will have within a larger foreign exchange trading operation okay you will have a separate option a uh, separate uh, operation which is a subgroup of that which will be fx option trading so you will have the fx option trading desk in that setup are you following yes, okay sir. so then again the fx option trading desk will have its own specialized sales and research functions so you will have fx option research within uh, you know within you will have some people within the fx research team who specialize purely on fx options research and they are going to feed the research to fx option investors people who want to trade in fx options either corporate customers or institutional customers who are going to trade in fx options and they will feed them research to help them to formulate a view is this clear yeah. so you have understood the function of sales and uh, research how they support the trading desk with well, essentially the trading desk has to have volume okay so remember market making what is the hallmark of market making what is the market making on sorry high volume, 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 yeah. high, volume low, high volume and low low volatility okay low, low price more you know limited price movement high volume so they have the have to get the high volume so the job of sales and research really is to generate that volume for the trading desk so the more interest you can create in a particular type of product 
the more the investors would want to trade that kind of product and that will generate volume for the trading desk this is clear okay so this is the setup right so what is your question you mentioned so first of all so get all these points clear okay so this is all part of the front office within any market making operation you have a front office yeah the, like these are the companies which you are taking in facebook alibaba all are big companies yeah so they uh, so that they do not have to make more efforts in selling their shares but how what will the other companies do to make their sales of their shares you know we you are talking from a primary capital markets perspective so or I'm what in general of origination like we can take origination distribution and structuring yeah for inflation you tell sell potential so one minute let's just tell so test the origination distribution and structuring these uh, teams they are important in a pcm context or a scm context pcm pcm p as in patna p for patna right pcm and for where is dcm coming into the problem my question is whether we discuss three types of teams that you can see in an investment bank okay that is uh, origination distribution and structuring so my question is that uh, these three types of teams are they relevant in a pcm context as in p for patna or in a scm context as in s for singapore P, 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 right? That is a primary capital markets. Okay, so you are talking about a primary capital markets context where you have these three types of teams. Okay, now what is your question? Sir, like Alibaba is want to sell their shares. Yeah. So Alibaba will able to sell its shares easily. But what will be happen? What will happen in the case of other companies which do not have much name in the market? So how their sales will be made? See, the point of. Uh, the point of the what is the role of the distribution now you are talking about distribution right yes sir you realize that he is talking about distribution yes sir okay so he is saying that the shares of com well known companies like alibaba will be easy to sell okay but the shares of lesser known companies will be harder to sell so you are really talking about a distribution problem do you understand that they have to find for potential investors so that's the role of distribution their job is to sell the securities it's just no different from today you have well established brands in ice cream okay which are selling easily quality or amol or something will sell easily because everyone knows the brand brand if you come out with some new brand of ice cream uh, naturally customers will be reluctant to try it out because they don't know the brand so it's the same job that a salesman would have there okay same problem so that's the role of distribution okay the role of distribution is to let's see how alibaba has been doing because chinese stocks have not been doing well because of the trade war risk so alibaba has managed to hold up reasonably okay compared to what's happening in the chinese market okay all right so is your question answered okay that's the role of distribution okay if you are a good distribution team then you'll be able to sell even securities which are not so well known of of companies which are not so well known all right okay so we will continue with our uh, discussions where were we in the last class Does anyone? I think we discussed. Uh, we were discussing this uh, TAM versus AM, yes, right? Sir. Is that right? Yes. We were at TAM versus AM. And we can move to a. All right. So there is um, this stuff. If I have not already put it in your folder, all these files you will find in your folder. Okay. This one, then the TAM versus AM. I'll put them in your folder. Okay. Now let's uh, look at TAM versus AM. Okay, what were we discussing? I think we had discussed. It was leverage that we were discussing, right? I don't remember discussing performance evaluation benchmarks. No, so we have discussed leverage. Okay, so the leverage notes I have already put in to your uh, discussion on leverage. So this is a bit too big. No, I'll just and I'll as soon as the class is over, I'll put this into your folder. So you'll have this. Okay, where is this? Um, yeah, so this discussion that we had on leverage that has now been put into your notes. Okay, I'll make all this the same font size. All right, now we go into the next point, which is um, so when we let discuss leverage, if you get position value divided by account equity, if you get a figure of five or something, sometimes we say that the leverage ratio is five is to one. or we just say that the leverage uh, multiple is 5 that's how we would express it normally okay all right so benchmark so the next point is what are the differences between tam and am when it comes to benchmarks for professional okay what is happening here now uh, parmeet and uh, ridhima same team i have to deduct now where is ridhima's team <coughs> Okay. 
So you had a fairly low score. Now you're raising your performance level. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's understand this a little bit. Uh, okay. So benchmarks are these three. If you notice, I have put these under five, six, and seven. Point numbers five, six, and seven are in uh, one particular block. Yes. Okay. I put the blue line there. Uh, because they're all connected okay try to see first of all try to see how they're connected because obviously there's performance evaluation so depending on how i evaluate your performance okay so because you're getting minus marks for cp so, so that's why uh, so you see that performance evaluation is uh, also connected to risk management because you're getting minus marks on cp ashil is trying to manage the risk by making sure that nobody in her group is talking okay because she knows that it will affect performance evaluation so you can see that there's a connection between performance evaluation and risk management okay so depending on how you're evaluated you will manage the risk from that perspective this has a bearing because actually it has a very uh, it has very uh, different implications uh, for uh, for TAM, in the case of tam versus am okay so and then the last is also compensation you guys also compensation eventually your is also connected to your compensation so if you get performance evaluation if you get minus marks in cp eventually it will affect your uh, compensation and for you guys as grades okay so it will affect your grade so if your performance is deemed to be poor so in the industry also what you will find is that performance your uh, compensation okay compensation is related to your performance if your performance is poor your compensation will be less okay yeah so say uh, that's a classic example if you see a salesman most salesmen get a very low base salary and they get com compensated as a uh, percentage of sales so they get a sales commission so a salesman a good salesman the sky is the limit as far as your earnings is concerned because if you uh, sell a lot of uh, you know products then you will get high uh, income as a percentage of sales okay so compensation is again related to performance okay so because you want to at the end of the day your main goal is for compensation your main goal just like for you guys the main goal is grades okay but then because you know how the grades are going to be affected by negative cp and all that so based on performance evaluation standards you manage your risk accordingly now, if i had not been giving you minus marks for cp you guys would be talking more right like in the finance lab sessions i noticed that the when i was listening to the videos the noise level is much higher in the finance lab because this there is a little bit harder for me to monitor who's talking so those are very high noise levels in the, those videos. Okay, so first understand that these three are connected. Now we'll go through one by one. Okay, so benchmarks. So in the case of equity, in the case of TAM, okay, the way that benchmarks are done, uh, sorry, performance, eval performance evaluation in the case of TAM is that basic, uh, the, the first level performance evaluation is, let's talk about it here. Okay. So what we say is in the case of TAM, okay, this these notes are a little bit, they just need, these notes are actually arranged as I've taken TAM first as one block on top and then AM is at one block on top and in each of the blocks I've gone through each of the factors which you see here, which you see here the factors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. So in each block I've gone through each of the factors but probably as I was going through it today, it seems better to organize it as uh, you take each of the factors and then you first talk about AM and then you talk uh, first you talk about TAM and then you talk about AM. Fact, go factor wise rather than so I'll just rearrange those notes. But anyway, you will have the video so you can follow the discussion. Okay, so in as far as TAM is concerned, it is what we say asset class specific long only benchmarks. Now remember what long only is? Yes, sir. Net long only. You can only buy stocks and bonds, you can't go net short. Okay. So what we assume typical the most Here, what is written here in in uh, what is written here in English? I will explain to you visually. Uh, just understand the English first. So, what are we? Who are we evaluating? Whose performance are we evaluating? Long only equity mutual fund manager, which is pretty much the majority of your uh, mutual funds that you see. They are basically long only equity mutual funds. Okay, they may be different types of funds like growth funds or income funds or uh, value funds or whatever but they're mostly long on the equity mutual funds now benchmarking against implied long only buy and hold strategy 
broad based equity index such as S&P 500. If you do this in India, you would use an index like BSE 200 or something. If 50 is a bit narrow, okay, unless it's a particular portfolio that is very, uh, typically you would use a BSE 200 or something like that, okay. So, so something slightly bigger, broader universe. Uh, so anyway, but that again depends on the offer document, how you have uh, communicated it to the offer. But the idea, it will be some kind of broad index, okay. So in the US, if you have, if you have, if you're managing a small cap, so you have to get this flavor that depending on the class of securities that you're managing, okay. So if in the US, you're managing a small cap fund, then you would not benchmark against the S&P 500. The S&P 500 are very large cap companies. So in the US, there's a small cap index called the Russell 2000. Okay. No, Russell 2000 is small cap actually. Small. Russell is considered small cap. What is mid-cap? Mid-cap, I don't remember if there's any mid-cap. Maybe the Russell has some mid-cap stocks also. But so because these definitions are not sort of uniform around the world. So you have to define some cutoff level. The amount of capital authorization depends on uh, the level of organization that is medium or small. Yeah, so typically one of the ways to do it is you take more than 1 billion is taken as, less than 1 billion is taken as small cap. That's one way to do it, okay. But these are not cast in stone. You can sort of, but you have to be consistent. Whatever you set up, you should be consistent over time, at least in the medium term. Okay, so the point is here to understand that you will be benchmarking a mutual fund, okay, depending on what kind of securities it's planning to invest. If it's going low, small cap stocks, it's a specialized small cap fund, then you should evaluate it against a small cap index not against something like the nifty 50 which is a big which is large cap companies okay so that is the idea so this is how it works okay what we will do is we will look at the last point uh the point is that uh, your benchmark has to be uh, has to reflect the kind of uh, investor mandate that you have if your investor mandate remember the kind of markets that you will invest in okay in this case the markets will determine might be stated as you can invest only in this mutual fund you can only invest in small cap companies okay so if you can only invest in small cap companies you should not in evaluate that fund that mutual fund which can only invest in small cap companies should not be evaluated against a large cap index like the s&p 500 or the nifty 50 in india okay which is large cap companies so the benchmark should reflect the kind of fund strategy that you're following okay when you're investing so with what we will do is we'll just take this uh, as uh, let's take a, a stock like whatever I mean let's take any fund let's take we take we take Facebook as an example of a fund okay let's assume I'm just taking any because we don't we don't get to chart funds over here okay so if we have this performance of Facebook then what we are going to do is we are going to so essentially let's say that this is just a year one year period this is the, uh, the period that you this is the start of uh, the fund okay just to make it simple and this is the ending period of the fund okay so we want to see how much it has uh, moved okay so it has basically moved from your point here 45 let's say 45 to 150 okay so you see that the fund that you invested in has started at 45 and it has ended at 150 so the return is basically it has made this kind of return but the, this point is here is that this is just an absolute return because you're just looking at the return on the fund so we say this is an absolute return because you're just looking at the return on the fund okay so now absolute is going to be contrasted with the word what would be the other word relative, relative. okay so it is absolute now we want we are not interested only in absolute performance we are interested in what is called relative performance okay so we want to see wow this fund made a lot of money it started at 45 yeah so, so basically abstract of this is only okay, use the mic if we have the mic let's use the mic so that everything gets captured yeah so the basic aspect of this is that we should be consistent with our standards. We should be consistent with our standards. And this performance evaluation. Yeah, but this is not really about consistency. This is about the fact that you, the point here, that is the point that's being made here is that, yeah, you can come, but you won't get attendance. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, the point that is being made here, the specific point being made here is, but don't go to the back. Don't go to the back. You sit next to middle. All of you go and sit next to middle. Or Arihan can remain there, that's fine. Either you sit uh, in Arihan's row or in Mittal's row. Okay, similarly, you go and sit next to Arihan. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. So, we say the point that has been made here specifically is that we are not just interested. The first level, of course, what you look at at the first level, the first cut assessment. The first cut assessment is that uh, there is, uh, you see the absolute return on the fund. Okay. Now, okay, what is, uh, Mittal is talking? 
Metal has to get marks. Remember that you won't get attendance, but you can get negative CP. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I have forgotten your name. What, what is his name? Huh? He is not from finance. Okay. One minute. Uh, where is Mittal? Which which team is? No, Rahul's group. Mittal has managed to contribute to their score. Even though he doesn't have attendance. Okay. This is the beauty of CP. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, the point coming back to Gaba's question, the specific point that was being made there is that obviously when you look at the fund, the first thing you see is the absolute performance, but you can't just stop there because we are interested in the relative performance and in particular, we are interested in the performance relative to the benchmark. Okay. Whatever benchmark we have decided to apply for the evaluation of this fund. We have to see the performance of the fund relative to the benchmark. It is not sufficient to look at just the absolute performance. Okay, that and then consistency can apply when you have when you set a condition that the benchmark should remain the same. You should not use a different benchmark in different periods. Okay, like first quarter you use one benchmark, second quarter you use a different benchmark. Then you're not being consistent. So you can say that that is that way that is where you would apply the rule of consistency. This is clear? Okay. So now we said, okay, this fund is performed from $50, $45 to $150. That looks good. But that's not good enough for us. We have to do a comparison. Okay. Where is the comparison? Um, compare. Okay. So what we are going to do is we will just compare this. Now this is being a, let's take this as a Facebook. Okay. So this is all the, actually we are not looking at a fund. Because I we don't think I, I don't think we can get charts of funds here. But, but that's a whole index and we are comparing it to the share. One minute, I'm coming to that. So no, this is actually we are just assuming that the chart of Facebook is showing the uh, price movement of our fund. Okay. So let's assume this is a technology fund. Okay. We have technology fund. So uh, let's so therefore since it's a technology fund, which of these indices should we use, guys, as a benchmark? Anybody? Yes. What is it? Is my question clear? Which, if we are assuming that this chart of Facebook, which we are showing, we are just going to make believe that this actually is showing the price movement of a technology focused fund. In this case, what should be the benchmark that we should use out of the option that we have been given? DAX is the index in which country? We are assuming that this particular chart of Facebook, one minute, one, one at a time, one at a time, guys. One minute, one minute, one, one, one at a time. Okay, your answer is DAX. Okay, now let's let me clarify. Let's assume that this is an uh, this particular fund invests in U.S. technology companies. Now you said DAX. DAX is the index in which country? Germany. Okay. So DAX is the index in Germany. So that doesn't seem to be appropriate. And DAX is a broad based index in Germany. Okay. Okay. Next. Any other option? What can we use? S&P 500. Because Facebook is an American tech giant. So it would be absolutely perfect to make a comparison with the S&P 500. Okay. I'll just come back to you. Anybody else? Dow Jones. Okay. So none of you have come even by guessing and illumination. You haven't come to the right answer, which is the NASDAQ 100. Because the NASDAQ 100 is an index of tech stocks. The S&P 500 is a broad based large cap index. It does not have a it does not necessarily have a particular focus on technology. So this illustrates the point that we discussed earlier that when you are doing performance evaluation for a fund, you must know the nature of the fund and the benchmark should reflect the nature of the fund. So in this case, since the nature of the fund is a US uh, fund focused on technology companies, the best benchmark out of the options given to you here, the best possible benchmark is the NASDAQ 100. Okay. Or you can use a larger index there is, which is not shown to you here. There's a larger index called the NASDAQ composite, okay, which is a larger index. Uh, but the NASDAQ 100 is a narrower index. So this is the best option that you have here. So we should evaluate this fund against the NASDAQ 100. Is this clear? Okay. So we set up this thing. All right. Okay, now what do we see here guys? We see that there is uh, the the fund, the technology fund that we were focusing on. Mitchell, you want to lose more marks? What is your problem? <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, yeah you go and sit there. Okay. So what do we see now? We said that uh, it is not sufficient to look at absolute performance alone. We have to look at relative performance. So that's why having uh, uh, having seen the nature of the fund, which is a U.S. technology fund. Okay. So we are using the Nasdaq 100 as a benchmark, which is a tech index. So what we see is that the Nasdaq has in, uh, has gone up by 181 percent, and this fund has gone up by 293 percent. Is this clear? Okay, so we can. This is one way to do it. You can just take a simple ratio of the two. Okay, that you can see the outperformance. So the first, again, the next level. First level, we look at the absolute performance of the fund. So, sir, we can say that that uh, our fund has basically beaten the index. Yes, you can say that now. Here, you can say this. Okay, it is. So this is the. You can look at a performance evaluation of a fund can be done in many ways at many levels. Okay, at the first level, you look at the absolute return of the fund. Okay. And the second level, you now start looking at the relative performance of the fund. That's what Tushar has mentioned that this fund, we can say, uh, this fund has beaten the index, okay? Because the index has gone up 181%, the benchmark index, and the fund has gone up 293%, okay? That's the second level, okay? And so this is relative performance. And then, then you have a third level performance, okay? Which is that what you can have a risk adjusted return. So we should have, uh, maybe we can just do, um, we do three levels return SS yeah so we are coming to the sharp ratio at three levels okay okay so one is uh, absolute two is relative and three is risk adjusted okay so here we have sharp ratio or uh, sharp or there's another one which is sortino ratio okay so you can actually just this is essentially just taking care of the so there are two ratios here you can use the sharp ratio which is much more common people normally don't use the sortino sortino ratio but according to me if you're going to use risk adjusted return the sortino ratio is a better one because essentially these are just here risk is measured as standard deviation of returns okay but there are other ways to measure risk also. What is another way of measuring risk? SD, you will understand, standard deviation. What have you used in your project? Drawdown. Yeah, so drawdown is another measure of risk, which is more common in. So this is where you start to see the differences between AM and TAM and AM, okay? In TAM, so again, there are benchmarks also are quite different, the kind of benchmarks people focus on. So the sharp ratio business is much more common in TAM, okay? But in AM, it's, uh, it, you will see many people also using measures like drawdown, okay? Maximum drawdown is a measure of risk what you guys have used in your own project, okay? So that's a different way. So right now we are discussing only uh, TAM, okay? So here we can have, we can write TAM here. Yeah, this is all actually about TAM. We can just split up. Okay. So this is a, so here you can just you can just Google the sharp ratio and Sortino ratio. You will see it in your spreadsheet also where you had submitted the returns. Essentially, what these uh, risk adjusted means what they're doing is they're looking at the excess return and sharp ratio. They're just looking at the excess return of the portfolio. That is essentially your here. Your excess return is what are the excess return here? So yeah, 293 minus 181. 112. That is the excess return. Okay, they'll just look at the excess return and put it in the numerator, and then they will divide it by the standard deviation of this this series. This blue series is the return on your tech fund. Here, this is going up. This thing which we have used. So this 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 obviously this being time series data, this will have a standard deviation. You're just going to see a time series which is two columns, dates and prices. So you have returns. Are you following? Are you guys following? Yes. You can generate returns. So price and T my price and period T is price and T period T. Okay, minus price and period T minus one. That's your return. Okay, then divided by you can divide it by the price and period T. Okay, that would be your return. So you just have a series and then you take that standard deviation of that series. Okay, and that would be the uh, estimate of the riskiness of the return. Okay, so what happens in TAM? In TAM, what you're doing is you're looking at, uh, did you guys follow this? Yes. 
we don't need to go through standard deviation and all again obviously if you have time series data you can generate a standard deviation of that series so it's nothing but so this is your price uh, the fund price okay the fund price so therefore price in pre period t minus price in period t minus 1 will give you the return okay divided by the price in period t minus 1 okay or you can use natural logarithms you guys are familiar with natural logarithms this is something else that is used in finance natural logarithms you don't you haven't done natural logarithms no, sir. So you haven't done logarithms in, call, in school? No, no, no. Log base 10 and all yes, this. Yes, log, yes, log, 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 and log base E. Yes, sir. Log base E. So what is log base E? Log base E is a natural logarithm. One. Ln. Log e. Yeah, so log base E is called a natural logarithm. No, Ln. This is called log and this is called ln. Okay. So okay. okay. So natural logarithm, you should have known this also. Okay. Anyway, so natural. And that's another way of measuring the return. That's all. Okay. You take the natural logarithm of the price relative. When we get to option trading, when we'll calculate historical volatility, you will see that. Okay. So essentially, it's just this. In sharp ratio, what are you doing? You're just taking the uh, outperformance, which is two to two ninety three minus one eighty one, is the excess return. And you're just dividing it by the standard deviation of the return okay which is this this series you take this series you take the standard deviation of this series and that's your estimate of risk remember so this is the one way of measuring which is a very common way of measuring risk in finance especially in theoretical finance this is all they're doing okay they're just looking at they always measure uh, risk by standard deviation okay so you take this return because this is your funds uh, price movement so this funds returns can be calculated from this price movement and then you take the standard deviation of the risk returns to show you the estimate of the uh, riskiness of the fund so you're just doing so what do we mean by risk adjusted return all we are doing is uh, essentially you're doing you're dividing the uh, excess return divided by the standard deviation of the return okay is this clear to everyone that is similar to this remember what we did in your uh, project when we use the AM kind of, this is a TAM kind of evaluation system. The TAM way of doing risk adjusted return. In AM, when we did your long shot NSE equity trading project, what did we use? Uh, percentage profit divided by maximum drawdown. Okay. So it's the same concept. Essentially, on the top, in the numerator, you put the return. Okay. In the case of sharp ratio, you're putting the excess return. In the case of uh, our uh, our fund, we did not put the excess return. We just put the absolute return. Yes. And then we divided it by the risk, by our measure of risk. So risk adjusted return is nothing but return divided by risk. As a general principle, you can write this. Risk adjusted return means oh, this is not four actually. Risk adjusted return means the basic principle is return divided DIV is okay. Is this clear? The basic principle in risk adjusted return, whether it's in TAM or in AM, is return in the numerator, either excess return or the absolute return, and then you divide it by the risk. And the measure of risk can be different. In TAM, it is usually the standard deviation, and in AM, you can use other measures like maximum drawdown. So you should not be tied because in most most business schools when finance will be taught they will only be taught that risk means standard deviation standard deviation is the only way to measure risk okay but that's not really true there are other ways which is what i which is why i'm telling you about maximum drawdown which we have used it also which we have also used in your project evaluation that there are other ways to measure risk standard deviation is just one way to measure risk and the part i told you about the sortino ratio so the sharp ratio uses standard deviation okay now standard deviation from what you remember from your stats classes do you think the standard deviation measures both upside deviation or because standard deviation is going to be deviation around the mean right yes. so does it measure both upside or down both, both upside and downside variation or both, only one side both, both. both okay so one of the reasons that many people uh, don't like the sharp ratio is the sharp ratio uses just the standard uh, the the classical standard deviation measure which means that when the fund is fluctuating the price of the fund is fluctuating okay uh, the or the nav of the fund you can just think of it the nav of the fund okay this is going up and down like this now if the nav is fluctuating the standard deviation is going to capture both upside and downside fluctuation around the mean okay 
and the sharp ratio takes that standard deviation as the denominator okay as the return as the measure of risk okay but many people say that why should i be worried about upside fluctuation if it is fluctuating above the mean i am not really concerned when i'm making profits if I'm making there's a lot of fluctuation, but I'm always making profits above, you know, average profits, then I'm not really concerned. So I should be concerned only with downside standard deviation. Okay, so that kind of logic is that kind of idea is being put into place by what is called the Sortino ratio. That's why I put sharp stroke Sortino. Both are ratios. Okay, sharp ratio or Sortino ratio. Actually, they should be. Uh, yeah. I don't have to put the bracket. The comma, okay. Uh, Sir, yes. Please explain for Dino ratio beta. Yeah, and we're not going to go into the details of that because that calculation that use it, uh, it uses uh, definite integrals and all that. You guys have done definite integrals? Yes, sir. So you've done all that, yeah. but you must have forgotten by now, okay? Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the idea behind what you need to remember about what your real takeaway as finance students should be, you can look up these formulas, okay? They are there in your spreadsheet as well. If you look at, if you go back to your IPM evaluation spreadsheet, where you submitted the, which was uh, given to you, I think I didn't give you that spreadsheet. I, I just asked you to submit your returns, but essentially you can check the calculation of the sharp ratio. What the sharp ratio does, it uses in the denominator, it uses the standard deviation of the funds return, which is the classical standard deviation, which means it is looking at both sides. It's fluctuation above and below the mean on both sides, positive and negative fluctuations. Okay. That's what the sharp ratio is using. It is using a standard deviation whereas the Sortino ratio is the same concept as the sharp ratio except that it does not take the standard the classical standard deviation it takes only standard deviation below the mean okay for negative returns so it takes only standard deviation of negative returns okay so when the fund is losing money the standard deviation of those losing periods okay so it does a definite integral from minus infinity to the uh, level of the uh, to the zero okay so this is how the sortino ratio but the, what you need to remember you don't need to remember the calculation of this what you need to remember at a broad level is that there's this is a third level of assessing returns performance okay first is the absolute performance second is the relative performance to see the outperformance or underperformance and the third is a risk adjusted performance or the risk adjusted return okay and in risk adjusted return you can use either in tam you would be using the sharp ratio sortino ratio kind of measures okay where you would use uh, okay what is happening here satyam is uh, to very active but not talking very active but no he's very active with something his phone or something like that he's not talking no no he's not talking but he is very active Okay, he's very active on something else. Okay, where is Satyam? Which team? No, Satyam is not Tanu. Okay, sorry. Oh, no. Okay, all right, okay. Let's go into this, okay. All right. So, are you guys following? Everybody is looking kind of blank, like a long. No, 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 no. There is no leaving early. You need to concentrate. You need to apply yourself and concentrate. Okay, you are young people. You have uh, signed up for an MBA program. You need to concentrate and apply yourself because we have not covered a lot of material. In IFM, we should have finished covering a lot of material, including capital raising. So, the entire module on capital raising has not been covered. So this we will cover as much as we can today at least so that we can finish this framework. I don't even know if we can finish this framework today. But these are all things you need to be aware of. So please make sure you pay, pay attention and follow what is being taught. Are you following so far? Yes. Sir. Okay. So just remember these broad concepts. Even that will be an achievement if you can remember it conceptually clearly. But you have a third level of assessment which is risk adjusted return. And in TAM, the risk is being measured by standard deviation type of measures. Okay. Sorry, not yeah, in TAM and in AM we use mesh other measures also like max drawdown. Some people use even in AM, some people use sharp ratio because it's so popular, but it's actually more correct to use measures like maximum drawdown. Okay, so um, now uh, in, in this, uh, in, as far as the measurement of risk is concerned, you should also be aware that there is a refinement. So, the basic structure of this calculation of risk adjusted return is return on top divided by the risk, risk measure. That is the basic formula okay if you look up the sharp ratio formula you'll see that's the basic formula return on top either absolute return or excess return okay and in tam typically we will use the excess return on top 
divided by risk and the risk measure is standard deviation and Sortino ratio improves on the standard deviation by considering only the downside standard deviation. You follow the logic that we are not concerned with, you could say that we are not concerned with upside standard deviation because if I'm making returns, if I'm making positive returns, why should I worry even if it fluctuates a lot. Okay, so that's so that's these are the things you need to know. Okay, so in the case of AM, what is happening? So, so the main uh, difference is that uh, here. So, benchmarks for performance evaluation in in TAM, in, in TAM you have this. Okay, and here you typically get uh, some kind of a benchmark. Uh, this is called a hurdle rates. Okay, this is, we can use the hurdle rate. Okay. All right. So in the case of TAM, in the case of AM, what is happening is we are not using that kind of asset. We should not be using actually some people still use it, but it's not a correct way. The correct way to look at is uh, the performance uh, return in excess of some kind of opportunity cost. Like I gave you the example of Oak Tree. We mentioned Oak Tree, which is Howard Marx's company, which is a very famous uh, distressed debt investor. Okay. So they are a value investor in the debt space in this asset class called debt. They are actually a value investor. They wait for prices to fall sharply below what they think to be the fair, assessed to be the fair value, and then they go in and pounce. So they wait. Basically, most of the time they're waiting. They're waiting for a market panic, okay, uh, and waiting for prices to be sold off heavily, and then they will go and pounce and like they did in the financial crisis. So they did in the financial crisis in 2008. Before 2000, in 2007 itself, they raised a, raised a large fund about 100 billion over 100 billion or something like that and then when they were waiting because they knew that there would be some kind of uh, crash because prices were too high so they were waiting as soon as the crash came when everybody was selling in a panic then they went in and bought okay because the prices were deeply discounted okay so that's the idea that's how a value investor operates that's also how Warren Buffett operates the difference between Warren Buffett and Howard Marks both are value investors but Buffett operates mainly in equities and this guy operates in debt okay but their basic thinking is the same all right so these guys now oak tree has a hurdle rate which is now now around eight percent so the hurdle rate in uh, in performance evaluation I see what they're going to look at is that they're going to look at some kind of absolute return which is uh, I mean uh, uh, some kind of opportunity cost so her hurdle rate for oak tree means that oak tree doesn't get paid remember that this is tied to compensation okay so this is tied to compensation so these guys so if you have a hurdle rate of eight percent okay what that means is that oak tree will not get any money any compensation unless they make eight percent at least so you get paid you understand what a hurdle is remember 100 meter hurdles or 110 meter hurdles right you remember that race yeah. right so you have to cross the hurdle which means so hurdle rate of eight percent means they don't get paid if they make only 6% in a year, they don't get any compensation because they have not cleared the hurdle rate. Okay. So if they make 14%, then they will get paid and if the hurdle rate is 8%, then they will get paid on the assumption that they have made 6% excess return. So they will be paid according to only that 6%, which is only the excess that they've, although they've actually made 14%, okay, as an absolute return. Okay, but here they're going to be paid only according to the 6%, which is the excess return over the hurdle. Okay, so the hurdle you notice here that uh, this is kind of like a benchmark. The hurdle is operating like a benchmark. Just like we are, here we are saying that your technology fund has made about 112% 112, uh, 112 excess return. Why? Because it's 112% uh, better than the benchmark. Performance is better than the benchmark. Okay. In this case, we don't set in the case of TAM. In the case of TAM, we don't set a asset class specific benchmark. Okay. Like in this case, what we are setting is if you see here, why does it say asset class specific long only benchmark? Because this was a technology fund investing in equities. So we took a technology index like this one, the NASDAQ 100. We took a index of technology companies and it's a stock index. It's not a bond index. Okay, so NASDAQ 100 is basically the stocks of technology companies, the equity shares of com technology companies. So we took the asset class specific and we assumed that instead of in investing in this technology fund, what if we had taken that money and invested it in, a, in the technology index? 
So it's a what if kind of analysis. When you're doing a benchmark benchmarking, it's kind of like a what if analysis in some way. Okay. So you assume that you know if you ask this question, what if we had invested in this index? Well, it show, turns out that if you had invested in the index, you would have made 181 percent. But by investing in the fund, you have made 293 percent. So the fund has outperformed by 112 percent. Okay. The same thing, so same kind of broad broad thinking is going to be applied in in uh, TAM also in AM also. But in this case, our benchmark is not some kind of technology index or some distressed debt index or anything like that. It is going to be some kind of absolute return like this. You can see in the case of Oak Tree, the hurdle rate is 8%. So if they make 14%, they won't be paid on the basis of having made 14% because their hurdle rate is 8%. So their compensation is going to be really based on the outperformance, which is the 6%. Okay. So, but, so this hurdle rate can be said in many ways. It is uh, the main idea in the hurdle rate is again to reflect some kind of opportunity cost. Okay, that if I'm an investor, why should I invest with Oak Tree? Instead of investing with Oak Tree, I could have invested, taken my money and put it into treasury bills. It's a safe asset. I could have just bought US treasury, US government bills, government, uh, US, uh, uh, I mean, treasury bills is basically part of the US government. So US government obligations. So I could have just invested in treasury bills. And maybe I can make 2% or 3% by making investing in treasury bills. So I could set that kind of a benchmark as well. In this case, they have set it at 8%, which is basically, it's just meant to reflect an opportunity cost for the investor. So it's clear. This is the idea behind the benchmark. Okay. All right. So these are sometimes called hurdle rates also. So this is another way of doing it. Okay. What I would just say here is that. So AM is just alternative asset managers in this case. Okay, use uh, benchmarks similar to TAM but this is not correct actually. There are many you will find many very often in the media when you are listening to Bloomberg news they might talk about some particular hedge fund okay they might say that hedge funds have produced only 0.2 percent this year okay and they will compare it to the return on the s p 500 and they'll say the s p 500 has produced 16 percent returns this year so they're effectively using the s p 500 as the benchmark but that is actually not conceptually correct okay some fund managers also do this but the correct way to measure am funds is again some kind of absolute return benchmark okay which they have set Typically, the best way to do it logically, according to me, is to set some kind of alternative which the fund manager, which the investor could have used. Instead of investing in a hedge fund, I could have put my money in US uh, treasury, no, uh, treasury bills. Okay, if you take an annual perspective, every year you evaluate the performance. So at the beginning of every year, I have two options. I can invest my money in a hedge fund or I can just put my money in one year treasury bills. So when I look at whether the hedge fund has actually done uh, well, I will compare it to what I could have got by just investing in pure risk-free treasury bills for one year. So if I could have got a 3% return in the treasury bill for one year and the hedge fund has made like 4.5%. So I'm not going to say that you guys have great, you made 4.5%. You actually made only 1.5% excess return over the treasury bill, which is my opportunity cost of investing your, in your fund. Instead of because I'm investing in your fund, now I cannot invest that money in the treasury bill okay so that is the idea behind the setting up of a benchmark okay so some people do use the s p 500 even in am but that's not actually correct okay so i'll just say this is incorrect okay conceptually it's incorrect okay so return this is already mentioned and has already discussed with you okay that returns in excess of op op opportunity cost this is happening in the case of uh, am okay this is in the case of am Okay. Are you following the structure of this note? Now I'm just trying to rewrite the note that this is the point that is being discussed, benchmarks, and then we are discussing it separately for TAM and for AM. This okay? Is this okay? Okay. There is an article there as well. I'm not going to open it because uh, this is now behind a paywall. So you can open it and read it on your own. Okay. So the, the two ways that you use uh, benchmarks and AM. Either you use some kind of absolute opportunity cost, uh, you know, you, some kind of opportunity cost measure like uh, return on treasury bills 
or you can sometimes compare it to a peer group again this is not very uh, you know not ideal this is the best way to do it okay sometimes you compare it like if you have for instance what is meant by peer group you understand what is peer group yes. same class of people okay so if you have so you might actually if you are evaluating the returns for oak tree suppose oak tree has made 14% uh, uh, return in a year okay one of the ways you can evaluate their performance is to look at now what is what kind of fund is oak tree it's not an it doesn't not it's, it's not investing in equities okay it's not investing in currencies or commodities okay. it's a pure debt fund okay and in particular it actually is a it's, it's a fund that focuses on the credit play okay so but it's a debt fund okay so and it's mainly a distressed debt fund so you would compare it to its peer group so that you would look at what is the average of there will be other distressed debt funds in the market there will be other funds like that who are trying to do the same thing okay so they would look you would look at the entire universe of distressed debt funds or other debt funds which are trying to you know credit based funds okay we're trying to play on credit risk so uh, you would look at that universe and you would see maybe that the average of the average return on those funds is maybe let's say 11 percent okay so then you'll say that uh, oak tree has outperformed its peer group by three percent because they've made 14 percent and the average return of the peer group is 11 percent are you getting the idea okay it's the same kind of idea that you have to compare like for like you can't compare apples to oranges it's the same idea when we discuss the when we discuss the return of a small small cap equity fund so we said that if you are evaluating the return of a small cap equity fund you cannot use a benchmark which is like something like the S&P 500 or the Nifty 50 in India, which are basically large cap indices. So if your fund is a small cap fund, you should not see the return of that fund in relation to a large cap index. It should be a small cap index. Is this clear? So like for like, that's the basic idea. Okay, so peer group investing, and this is also according to me, uh, also not really the correct way. The correct way is only the 5A. Is this actually five? Yeah, it is five. So it is the correct way is only five way, but this is less incorrect than the others. So I'll put than the for previous one. So I'll put incorrect with a question mark. Okay. Now five seven is compensation. What is six? Six is risk management. Okay, this is also very important to understand. Okay, that uh, so you have to understand is that risk management is connected to how performance is being evaluated. Okay, so in TAM. The risk management, you'll hear this term called tracking error. Have you heard this term? Some of you worked in your summer projects with uh, people like S error. SMC. So, tracking error may be not keeping, uh, not being up to date. Use the mic properly. Or uh, tracking error may be uh, like, uh, may, maybe not, uh, not keeping update to the market properly, like day to day. Yeah, sort of, almost correct. So tracking error is nothing but your tracking. Remember, what is your benchmark in TAM? Your main benchmark in TAM is your, if we don't get into the risk adjusted return part at this point, okay, if we are looking at only the first two levels of assessing return, okay, we're looking at absolute return and relative, especially the second part, okay. If you're looking at this, because this is a very important focus, to what extent have you underperformed or outperformed relative to the index, okay. This is one of the more, very important ways of evaluating the funds, okay, of evaluating different funds. So therefore tracking error, this is a term that you need to be familiar with. Tracking error means the extent here. This is tracking error. Here there's not much tracking error. But here there is tracking error you could say that at this point, if you see that the fund when it first began, tracking error is just the, the extent to which you are actually uh, underperforming relative to the index. Okay. All right. Okay. Or you could take it as, you know, you could, if you have a positive tracking error, normally we do not use that term because error means negative. Okay. Error implies negativity. So tracking error means that here, if you look at this part, look at this part here where the, the benchmark is actually rising. The benchmark is rising, but the fund is falling. So here you have tracking error. So tracking error focuses on really the second type of, uh, the second type of, uh, perform uh, the second level of return assessment which is the relative return so in tracking error what you're doing is you're looking at uh, to what extent am i underperforming the index okay so some people use tracking error in both senses what is my performance relative to the index so even if they have a positive even if they're outperforming the index we say they say we have a positive tracking error but according to me that's not a correct way of using the term because 
error would necessarily imply negative performance okay so tracking error should be taken as only under performance relative to the index so when you're looking at risk it's the same thing with respect to risk some people think that any kind of fluctuation is risk but i would say that only downside fluctuation is risk only when you're losing money okay so track so the focus of tam funds because tam funds are all going to be evaluated on relative performance to the index so the all they care about okay that see how this leads to very perverse results okay the the tam managers all they care about is performance relative to the index they don't care about positive of absolute performance per se okay so that means in a negative period okay if you look at this if you look at a negative period which is uh, you don't see it here because facebook came out after the um, if we change i don't think we can change facebook here uh, we don't have an option of changing facebook um, we don't have the option of changing facebook here but anyway the point is that you remember that in the in the uh, let me just remove this for instance okay let me let me take a stock on and then we don't have uh, uh, remove this okay let me take this as uh, let me take a stock on which we'll have a lot of history okay let's have msft okay now let's have uh, ge okay and hopefully we have a lot of history on gv going beyond uh, let's see if we have one week data and then we go into the yeah now you see this we cover the financial crisis okay now let's see um see the point assuming now now let's assume that this is your fund okay this is your fund okay so you would assume that when this fund is falling like this is what year 2000 this is what this is 2008 okay so here your fund is falling right your fund is falling here losing money so the point of tracking error being the focus of risk management in the in the case of tam is because they are only evaluated relative to the performance of the benchmark okay so they don't really care if they're losing money because as you can see here if we compare this to the if we uh, compare this to the in the case of ge what what can we use we can use either dow 30 or s p 500 because dow 30 is again very large cap stocks and ge was at least at that time a large cap stock now it's in all kinds of trouble okay uh, let's do this and see okay now you see something here what are we talking about guys let's understand this let's understand what is meant by tracking error you see this part here during the financial crisis when Lehman was going bankrupt here in September of September of 28 2008 what is happening the fund is falling yes. and the, the benchmark is in orange what is happening to the benchmark it's rising. benchmark is not rising benchmark is also falling okay that particular day. yeah if you look at this let's focus it let's zero in on this okay let's try to focus in on this my, my computer might be hanging here okay yeah you can see here what's happening guys and this is the time when so Lehman went bankrupt I think around 15 September 2008 okay yeah this is the time so what is happening after this the fund is falling the fund is in blue and the index is also falling okay now the returns may be a little bit uh, different okay the negative returns may be a little bit different okay but let's assume that uh, let's for the sake of the point the first point to note here is that on the face of it it seemed like there was the there was a problem because our fund was falling in value but then we look at remember we are not going to be evaluated on an absolute return basis we are going to be evaluated on a relative return basis okay and then finally on risk adjusted return but relative return is one of the most important ways of evaluating funds okay so then i look at the index but what's happening to the index and let's assume that for the sake of argument we are going to assume that let's say year to date our fund in september is down 25 percent okay but let's assume that year to date the index is down 30 percent okay so actually i'm a hero because i'm outperforming the index you realize that yes sir. because i'm down only 25 percent the fund is down 30 percent sorry uh, my fund is down only 25 percent but the benchmark is down 30 percent okay so this is the problem of tam this is one of the problems of tam because they are only concerned with outperforming their benchmarks they are not concerned with absolute return as such okay so this obviously as an investor are you going to be happy like if this is what is happening to your fund 
if you have invested in the fund and the fund manager the tells initial, me on the initial stages we could have no no if the fund if you have invested in a fund and the fund manager is the fund is down 25% but when you call up the fund manager he says don't talk to me i am a hero because the market is down 30% and i am only down 25% is this something that's going to make you happy as an investor no so this is one of the problems of tam that you should be aware of that tam managers because again everything is driven by incentives okay why are you trying to keep quiet in the class why is actual managing people because it's all incentives okay because we have been you have fear you know that if you get caught talking you will lose marks and that will affect your grade eventually so your compensation gets affected so your performance evaluation is negative for compensation gets affected so it's all about incentive so because we are incentivizing mutual fund managers which is basically the large universe of tam people okay we are incentivizing them to perform or on a relative uh, performance basis compared to the index so they that's all they care about okay so the index is down they are also down but as long as they are down less they are happy okay so this is one of the perverse uh, kind of uh, results that you get in uh, tam okay you have to be aware of this okay in case of uh, in the case of am what were we using as a measure of risk absolute absolute uh, no what were we using as a measure of risk as a measure of risk drawdown okay so what is drawdown now if you are losing money you are automatically focused on drawdown do you realize this if you are losing money then your that itself is drawdown yes sir so that means you get you become focused on any kind of loss in your own fund because your risk measure is actually you are you're not being evaluated relative to a particular benchmark you have a hurdle rate obviously to meet okay but because your risk measure is drawdown they tend to be much more focused on absolute losses whereas in tam you are not so focused on absolute losses you are focused on losses relative to the benchmark okay so the tracking error this is basically in tam what we call tracking error tracking error means if your index is down if the benchmark is down 30% okay and you're down 35% then you have a 5% tracking error relative to the index so the index is down only 30% but you are down 35% this is clear okay so but in in uh, in app people tend to be much more focused especially the futures fund managers they tend to be much more focused on uh, absolute returns absolute losses also okay all right so compensation so is this point clear now risk management yes, so you have to understand the linkages between uh, the various factors okay especially these three factors 5 6 and 7 that the way you decide to do performance uh, benchmark performance evaluation and then compensation is tied to performance evaluation and then the way you because compensation is tied to it it affects the risk management behavior so a tam fund tends to be focused only on tracking error they are not really bothered if they are down on an absolute basis they are focused only on tracking error whereas the am funds tend to be much more focused on because the drawdown aspect is going to come into the return uh, calculation so they are much more focused on uh, absolute uh, losses okay now the third part is compensation typically how is compensation done okay compensation yeah so in the case of um in the case of tam we'll just copy this you understand this expression called aum yes sir yeah aum is assets under management okay all right so in the case of tam compensation is how is the fund manager going to get paid so in the case of tam some of you might have been investing in mutual funds they would typically charge a percentage of the assets under management okay so in mutual funds you'll be uh, charged a percentage of assets and on management and then um, okay this there is a different we will come to the difference between passive versus active okay passive is basically your etf types okay active is your traditional mutual fund all right active mutual fund means simply that like say your hdfc uh, mutual fund okay they might have a growth fund hdfc growth fund active means that the performance the uh, fund manager is taking active decisions 
to even though he may be evaluated against let's say that the hdfc growth fund is going to be evaluated against the nifty 50 the benchmark of for that particular fund okay so you will take the hdfc growth fund their benchmark let's say is the nifty 50 okay the meaning of active is active portfolio management versus passive portfolio management okay so active versus passive versus active uh, portfolio management this is a term that you that comes up in our last point in discussion uh, passive versus active portfolio management try to understand this what is uh, what is passive versus active active means okay first you understand okay HDFC growth fund their benchmark is going to be the uh, let's say the nifty 50 stock index okay now what is going to happen is now what is going to happen in the case of the um, nifty, uh, in the case of the hdfc growth fund is going to be evaluating in nifty 50 stock index so one of the safest strategies for this fund manager is to minimize tracking error to have no tracking error at all no risk of tracking error the safest thing he can do is he can just buy all the nifty 50 stocks and sit on it you understand this yes sir. because he's only going to be evaluated against performance of the nifty 50 so he can just buy the nifty 50 stocks in the same proportion okay as they are on the index so then he can never have any tracking error his tracking error is always going to be zero because whatever happens to the nifty 50 index he is just monitoring that he's just following that is this point clear yes. okay so this safe strategy this is called this i'm Can just positions change after so <laughs> no no one sec what i'm saying is if he wants to be very very conservative if he wants to play it really safe because he's going to be evaluated against the benchmark which is nifty 50 okay so the safest thing for him to do if you i'm just taking an extreme example then we will look at other variations what are the options open to him one option that is open to him to minimize tracking error is to just say okay i'm not i'm just going to buy the same stocks in the same proportion as they exist in the nifty 50 index right so now i'm safe i can't you can't touch me because my tracking error will always be zero okay it it, it can only be positive it can't be negative okay we are the same stock now this thing is called closet indexing okay you should know this term as well okay since i've explained it i'm not going to write it here this is if what you are doing if an active portfolio manager actually what he does is instead of actively selecting some stocks he just mimics the index by buying the stocks no one can stop him from doing that okay but if he does that this is called closet indexing okay so the term closet comes from the expression that you know when people come out and express their true nature then we say they've come out of the closet you heard the expression yes sir right like like when gay people come out and say i'm gay like tim cook said so we say that he's coming out of the closet okay so that's where the expression comes from so closet indexing means you're actually pretending to be an active portfolio manager but you're actually just a indexer you are just mimicking the index so that's why we say closet indexing clear okay so this expression this view is this behavior is called closet indexing okay now the other option that is available to him is if he really wants to be an active portfolio manager is he will select a bunch of stocks which he thinks are actually going to be growth stocks which may not reflect the stocks in the ft50 it could be a different set of stocks okay so then he can now two things can happen he may turn out to be right and his portfolio might do better than the nifty 50 but he's also taking a risk because he may turn out to be wrong how he his performance his portfolio that he selected might actually do worse than the nifty 50 is this clear yes, both sides of both types of, of uh, outcomes are possible yes. now this what he's doing if he does this this is called true active portfolio management active portfolio management essentially means that you select you actively select a mix of stocks which do not reflect your benchmark index okay so hdfc growth fund benchmark index has been set as nifty 50 stocks so typically you would expect a true active manager to select any number of other stocks which are growth funds growth stocks but which do not necessarily make up the nifty 50 so he should not basically an active fund manager should not be engaging in closet indexing are you following closet indexing you know what it is you pretend to the world that you are an active manager okay and then you actually are just mimicking the index like, like mimicking, uh, the index behind the behind your curtain. mimicking means you're just doing whatever like if, if he does mind. this then i also do this mimicking means i'm doing exactly what the other person is doing mimic mimic means that basically right yeah so it is like behind the curtain strategy you could say that yeah it's behind the curtain that's why we say closet closet you understand closet is basically where you put your clothes it's covered 
okay so that's why right so this is clear okay so essentially you can understand pass you can understand active investing by understanding first closet indexing active in active investment can active investing active portfolio management in order to understand active portfolio management it is useful to first understand what is closet indexing closet indexing means you're pretending to the world that you are act an active portfolio manager and then you are actually what you're doing is you're just mimicking the index you're just replicating the index okay but you're pretending to be an active portfolio manager so that's why it's called closet indexing just like when gay people like everybody thought tim cook was straight but then he came out of the closet and told people that he was gay so that's why you know we say he's come out of the closet okay so that's the expression that is used so you can if active portfolio management essentially what it means is that you are not a closet indexer you are actively selecting stocks which are different from what is there in the index so you take the risk that you could have some kind of uh, tracking error okay that's what is active portfolio management passive portfolio management is just basically just investing in the index okay so i've given you etf etf probably is not um, a best way though not the best way to investing in the index so what i do some some of the etfs are actually um uh, including through etfs okay some etfs like one i'll just give you an example people are getting restless people are getting restless three minutes two and a half minutes one minute one minute let me just explain one minute let me explain one one little thing one one last point okay one last point okay spy one sec investing uh, passive understand the act difference between active and passive okay so passive portfolio management nothing is nothing but just indexing it's also called indexing okay uh, so what you do in passive portfolio management is like this spy is an etf spy is a very fa uh, famous etf okay most liquid etf in the world it mimics the s p 500 index okay so it's an it's an etf that follows the performance of the index so instead of investing in active mutual funds active portfolio <coughs> mutual act active portfolio management funds you just invest in an etf like the spy which just mirrors the s p 500 index it will replicate the index so here the advantage why do people do passive management as opposed to active management because the fees are less okay i'm not going to write this but the reason that people do remember that you pay in compensation for tam is percentage of aum okay but in active portfolio management the fees are higher so an active mutual fund might charge one percent of aum that expense ratio expense ratio that is basically that expense, ratio. It. expense ratio is the basically the compensation yes. okay so expense ratio you will notice if you study mutual funds expense ratios for active funds active portfolio management funds are higher than the ratios for passive funds for active management more active is taking more, more decisions risk. you know taking doing more analysis these guys are just replicating the index is this clear yes okay good now you've all become experts in finance and i you owe me 15 seconds okay, okay fine no problem so i'll see you in uh, next in the term after the next semester no, okay all right okay yeah yeah happy to index technique is a part of the classifying and